Okay, I have to go back to my Zoom. Where is the Zoom? Share screen. Desktop to share. Okay. Okay, okay. Now let's go here. Hit this button. Okay. Thanks for the screen sharing. Okay. I think we can start the class. Let's see, there are 15 participants, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. You have 25 in the class. So somebody either decided to join a little later or enjoying a warm weather somewhere, right? Hopefully. Okay, let's get on with the class. Um, See, this class is kind of um, at the mercy of uh, other uh, individuals to uh, provide their guest lectures. So in a sense, like, you know, Ryan gave his lecture on meat processing. We had Kim come on talking about packaging. We had Bill come and talk about grain processing. So those things kind of like gave a, a discontinuity, if you want to put it that way. So if I'm the only one teaching the class, probably that may not be the case. And I will be going right along with thermal processing. We talked about sterilization. We talked about pasteurization. And that's the same thing continuing right now with baking, roasting, broiling, grilling. And then Friday, we will talk more about frying kind of. So like, even though like it's all the same uh, fundamental principle we talked about, adding heat. We are still in this adding heat, but in the in the in the middle, we took a break of adding other topics, and then um, Dr. Dave Smith wanted to talk about some of the topics like separations topic, uh, homogenization, kind of those sort of things. Uh, the idea the idea is like by the time we start our uh, labs, some of the lab also do require that information kind of so it's kind of a little disorganized the way that it is designed the courses if we redesign the course completely only one person teaching it things could be in a, in a logical sequence but since we have guest lectures and i feel like instead of me teaching all of the material when you bring in an expert like you know uh, bill uh, has worked in uh, in this uh, grain science area for quite a quite a bit of time and he has first-hand experience from the industry so him talking more about the things that that's close to him is more valuable than me giving the same lecture same thing with kim carswell she's in in the packaging for such a long time and she's actually leading the packaging effort at target so that's also makes more sense that she talks about it. and then say like you know ryan cox he basically fired you guys about you know, meat uh, part, as I told you several times, even a vegetarian would say, should I try taste the meat, you know, kind of after listening to the rhyme. So that's what I was saying, like, you know, those are the experts giving. And then when you are asking the experts to come, we got to go with their timing, right? We cannot, like beggars cannot be choosers. So if they say like, you know, I can come only this week of the, the whole semester, we got to accommodate them. So, I, I, and the reason I'm just explaining this is we have received a student comments from the course and some other comment was this, oh, this course is so disorganized, which I accept that. Yeah, it, it's in, 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 you know, intentionally done that way, you know, so that to, we can accommodate experts in the field. And also like when you have multiple people teach the class, everybody has their own style, everybody has their own way of delivering the material may not be uniform and, and, and the like. The other thing I would like to apologize, I uh, should not, normally I don't, is the delay in my evaluating or assignment to one, which you have all submitted. It's all done nicely. I have browsed them through, did not find anything alarmingly incorrect, but I could give them the points. 
but the thing is like some of the problems that we talked about in the assignment one will be in your exam which is going to be next week so i'm going to work on the correcting the assignments with my comments before the say maybe like uh, before the end of tomorrow let's say so you should have your things back to you and as i said like you know as far as i have seen everybody did it pretty correctly so there's nothing really alarming in terms of what you did for assignment one okay and then today we are going to talk about topics related to baking roasting broiling grilling like all of them relevant to one one to um, each other and then uh, friday we'll talk frying so there's going to be a question from this lecture and also a question from friday's lecture in your exam that we will give it to you on friday so please listen carefully if you don't follow any of that let me know like i said like you know i'm available for your questions more the question that you ask me more that i get clarity that you know what you have uh, received from me because i may not be the right a great individual to deliver material but i'm trying my best okay and again another thing i come from an engineering background and that's another thing so like and i my expectations could be completely not necessarily in sync with uh, where you come from okay so you got to bear with me on that too uh, anyway let's continue with our material so let's ask, start with questions. Uh, this is fundamental question. So if you have taken a course relevant to that, in a, in maybe a food engineering course or any other physics per se, you should be able to answer the question. So list the modes of heat transfer in baking. So let's start with the folks down in the classroom. Again, no particular order. I don't want to call anybody to spot hmm? convection good hmm? convection good convection anything else anybody on the call zoom call like say they said convection conduction what else is there we have people on the Zoom well, saying radiation. Who said that? A uh, couple of people on Zoom. On the Zoom, on the chat. Oh, thank you, thank you. Radiation, super. Oh, I didn't see the chat. Okay, Kat, you can help me with that. So, pretty, pretty good. All right. Now the next question is, what is the primary mode of heat transfer during grilling? I'm going from baking to grilling. Now we talked about convection, conduction, radiation. So of, of all the three, which is the primary mode of heat transfer during drilling? Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Just you be honest with what you know. What do you think? Guessing radiation. Okay. Any in the chat? What do they think? Conduction. Conduction. You say convection? Okay, equally. Let's see, maybe we should do a poll. Which one would be the, the predominant heat transfer? Maybe you can all like give which one is one in your chat. Convection, conduction, radiation, which one? What do you think? I think radiation. You also say radiation? <laughs> yeah. Maybe you are your easier friend because of that? <laughs> huh? Now you are? Yeah. Now you are, okay. How about that in the back? You also say conduction? Okay. How about the chat right now? We're getting more coming there. We got Any a couple other? more people say conduction. More people say conduction? Okay, good. Let's Let's keep it that way. Then rotisserie cooking, how do you consider that? Is it a roasting or grilling operation? Roasting. Roasting, 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 roasting. Okay, any, any in the Zoom? What do you think? Roasting. Rotisserie cooking, roasting or grilling? 
Roasting. Roasting. Okay. Let's see whether you, are, you guys are right. So baking is basically same as roasting. They are the same, very similar. Essentially one and the same. And using heated air, that's the that's key word, using heated air to alter the quality of the foods. Basically you are cooking the food using hot air. Yeah. Once you say air is the one doing the job, the predominant heat transfer for baking will be convection, convection cooking. We are not talking about grilling, we're talking about baking. The question that I asked is for grilling. So for baking, the primary mode of heat transfer is convection because we use heated air. Baking refers to flour-based foods, baking a cookie, baking your bread, baking your pie. So baking mainly refers to flour-based foods compared to roasting refers to cooking meat, nuts, and vegetables. You roast your vegetables, you roast your nuts, or you roast your meat. You don't roast your cookie. You bake your cookie, okay? So baking refers to flour-based foods. But this also could be some kind of a mixture uh, comes along. Uh, let's say when you're talking about like a pot pie, which is kind of a flour base, but they are filling the pot pie with something else, right? So that could be, you now yeah, I'm, I'm cooking meat there. So should I call roasting the pot pie or, or baking the pot pie? Does it really matter? Does it really matter? That's a good question. But so both are used. That's what I'm saying. Like in, in, in that, abundantly, people say one or the other, but both refers to the same thing. And also when you're talking about baking or roasting in both, we can reduce microorganisms. And also we the reduce the microorganisms by the adding heat, the application of heat, also by removing water. Most of the baking roasting operations because of the hot air, they do remove water from your product. The product may still be wet or completely dry. So in terms of bread, in terms of your cookie, it's dry product. Compared to you, you, you roasted your vegetables or you roasted your meat, that's still wet. It's not dry completely, but you start with whatever the amount of water, the end amount is going to be lower than what you begin with. So there is a little bit of drying happens and a little bit of addition of heat. So the microbial reduction is twofold. One is by heat and by reducing the water activity. Okay? But the problem is, even when you are reducing the water activity, if you don't sufficiently reduce it to make the product shelf stable. So like, you know, a cooked meat, yeah, may stay longer on the shelf by itself, but not forever, right? Like it does, it, 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 it's going to be spoiled eventually, maybe like a day or two, right? Compared to a really dry product like nuts, uh, cookie, bread, yeah, they have a longer shelf life compared to your wet meat product or wet vegetable product. But you are extending the shelf life anyway. Like you know, if you keep a raw meat on the countertop, it can go spoil very quickly compared to you cook the meat on a countertop. There's a difference. Right? So you're, you're, you're altering the shelf life. So when you look at the, the baked goods information uh, from the industrial process, uh, bread is almost 40%. And then it's also bread, bread rolls. This is like bread, the sliced bread. This is like rolls. Then the next one would be cookies and crackers cakes, and then all the other um, miscellaneous items. So that's the way like you can see bread makes a major portion of baked goods in the marketplace. Okay. So heat transfer in, in baking or roasting, it has radiation from the oven walls and also convection from the circulating air the convection either it's natural, which means there is density difference, hot air will rise, cold air will go down, 
Manasi, the, the bottom cold air gets heated up, then it'll rise, push the air down, so it creates a natural convection, a air flow inside your oven. Or you have a fan that create a forced convection, okay? And then conduction also happens through the tray. Either you have a tray or your rack, through that, the conduction happens. Conduction heat transfer, radiation heat transfer, convection heat transfer, but the predominant heat transfer in roasting and baking is convection. Okay? So how do I measure the heat transfer coefficient? This is going to be holding true for uh, baking, roasting, grilling, broiling, everything. Where we have an overall heat transfer, which is basically an overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area where the heat transfer happens, which means the temperature of the medium, heating medium, to temperature at the surface of the food. So that's a driving force for your heat transfer. Okay? So H is heat transfer coefficient, overall heat transfer coefficient. A is the surface area where the surface is being involved in terms of your heat transfer. And then this is TA, is the ambient, the temperature of the air, temperature of the hot air, okay, or temperature of the, the heating medium. And then this is surface temperature. But on the other hand, like what is overall heat transfer coefficient? That includes both convection and radiation. We don't talk about conduction because conduction is not overall heat transfer. That is within the bulb, within the product, or most of the time. So when in the heat transfer coefficients, only H comes in, H convection. And H radiation. But when you look at Q convection, I think this A should be, ah, I just fixed everything, but okay. Somehow this, uh, let me do it again. Sorry. This should be, no. I did, I don't know, somehow this file doesn't get saved. I hate this. Uh, Microsoft, Microsoft. Oh. Let's see here. Uh, there it is. Give me a minute. all these superscripts, subscripts. I'm gonna save it and then I'll open it tomorrow. It'll be all messed up. I don't know. I have no idea why that happens. Okay, Man, I believe it's right. So the convection heat transfer is, convection heat transfer coefficient times area, times delta D. It's very nice, very similar to this, two or same. But the heat transfer for radiation, what is heat transfer for radiation? It's basically sigma, epsilon, area, times temperature rise to the power four, with this, again, temperature of the surface rise to the power four. That's a Stephen Boltzmann constant. Epsilon is the emissivity, like black body radiation, if you all remember, in physics. Black body will absorb all the heat, all the light, all the, and then, so kind of like emissivity, emissivity for a black body is what? One. So anything less than that, the emissivity could be less than one. Right, so white one will reflect everything, emissivity video was zero, right? So the emissivity for a black body is one. So sigma is Stephen Boltzmann constant, area, so this is temperature rise to the power four, but then I, from there, I can rearrange this terminal term to get myself a H radiation so that I can do Q radiation will be H radiation times area times TA minus TS. So if I pull the TA minus TS out of this equation, this is what's happening. Sigma epsilon, TA to the power three, three TA squared TS, three TA TS squared minus TS three. It's just simple algebraic manipulation. 
a to the power four minus b to the power four is equal to a minus b times whatever that I have said there. So now by saying that, now I have an understanding. I can have an overall heat transfer coefficient, which will include both convective heat transfer and radiation heat transfer. Okay. Again, why do we need all this? If you are going to go mathematically model the, the baking process or the roasting process, you need to have a better handle on that. Could you go over again what TA and TS are, the variables, please? Uh, can you, who has asked me that question? What's, the, what's a TA and what's TS again? TA is the temperature of the air, air temperature, TA. TS is the temperature at the surface of the food. Okay. TS is the surface. TA is the outside the air, temperature of the air, hot air. Okay. All right. But in a radiation heat transfer, the TA is not necessarily temperature of the air. If I have a, a radiating wall at a very high temperature, that should be the temperature of that. Let's say if I have a hot brick at say 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So my TA is that, not temperature of the air, the radiating walls temperature, okay? Maybe I should put TW, but I don't want to confuse too much there. So it's like TA minus TS. Let's keep it that way simple and move on. So mass transfer happens most of the time water vapor diffusion in the crust, liquid diffusion and capillary flow inside the core. So you have a crust, like bread has a crust, your cookie has a crust, your even roasted uh, meat has a crust, right? So the, within the crust, what happens is you have vapor transfer, but below the crust, within the core of your sample or the product, the water moves by either by liquid diffusion, because basically concentration gradient, or capillary flow, which means pressure mediated flow, okay? And then it's also the, the crust is gonna move in. The crust starts at the surface, and as the cooking continues, the crust moves inside, or you get a thicker crust, right? So that's what you call like a moving boundary. The boundary is not constant, not one place. As the crust is grow growing, your boundary is moving in. So what we call that is that boundary is the evaporation zone. Below the boundary line, water is liquid. Above the boundary line, water is vapor. So you have a vapor and the liquid, that's where the boundary is. That's why you call it evaporation zone, okay? And then since we have heat coming in, water going out, it's simultaneous heat and mass transfer. Is it all? Now we can throw in something else. There's also momentum transfer, what we call it a moving boundary, the physical boundary, a volumetric change. In terms of a product that will collapse, their structure, you see shrinkage, like your cookie dough. You start with a big dough, it collapses, the sugars collapse and then the structure things collapse, then you have a stronger shrinked product. Then also proteins denature, and the water coming out of it, dehydration. So all of that creates shrinkage. So that's a moving boundary. There's bread, you see volumetric expansion. You start with the dough, and then as the baking happens, it starts to bulge. It starts to increase in volume. That's also, again, a volumetric expansion. There's, a, again, boundaries changing. So they have uh, yeast being there or some of the leavening agents there. They produce gases. They produce, again, uh, changes in the, in the structure. Again, we talk about like gelatinization of starch that will incorporate air into it, create a new structure that expands the whole thing, right? So you have expansion and then in meat, you see both expansion happening and shrinkage happening. Shrinkage happens in the crust, expansion happens inside, inside the product. So that's even more complicated. Bread is complicated, bake, baking, but then roasting your meat even gets more complicated. So what happens at baking 
or a roasting process is simultaneous heat, mass, and momentum transfer. And even today, the mathematical modeling of baking process, mathematical modeling of roasting process is still ongoing. They have not had a, a perfect model yet. People are always make assumptions. They, they'll say, oh, I'll assume the, the properties don't change. Or somebody will say, the property changes this way. When you're talking about like your thermal properties, your mass transfer, the diffusional properties, all of them also function of the concentration. Like if you have less water or more water, the properties change. So as you're losing water, your thermal properties change. It's not changed, not constant anymore. Everything is so dynamic, it gets complicated. It gets crazy, okay? So again, look at it. The bread has a crust. And then this clearly see the crust compared to the force in here that creates a structure for your volumetric expansion compared to this is the chicken. You can see the same crust, but you can see a different structure inside too. Right? So roasting is uh, what different compared to baking. Baking, as I mentioned, it's mostly a dry product at the end uh, compared to roasting, compared to roasting. So in, in roasting, mostly what we do is we, you get the natural juices from the product that by creating a crust, you seal them inside. The crust has a poor water transmission ability. Like, you know, the vapor transfer is limiting. It's not going to go really, really fast. So the moment you form a crust, water inside your product is locked in. It cannot go very fast out. There is, there is a driving force. There is actually a air blowing on your product to take the water out. But the crust is saying that I'm not going to let you the water go out that easily. It's kind of like seals the, the locks the moisture in. That's so you get a juicy roasted product, okay? So normally <clears throat> roasting, you start with a high temperature, then you cook at a, a lower temperature to complete the process. That's why you, you, you want to form the crust quick so you can lock the moisture in, okay? On the other hand, like baking, we end up in a dry product. We don't care about locking the moisture in. I don't want a, a moist cookie. I want like you know crunchy cookie, right? So in that case, I want that water to be out. So you constantly bake the product at one high temperature. That's the difference between roasting and baking, okay? So we have different kinds of equipment for baking, direct heating ovens. Um, it's very, very popular in the industry. So this one is a, a conveyor belt, as you have seen the product, basically breads right now, as they're coming out of the, of the system, it's not like your home oven. You know, this is like industrial, industrial oven. Uh, where in the case, the, the heat is applied to the product directly. Okay. Indirect heating ovens is like you use a burning fuel to heat the air, and then you basically pump the hot air. Okay. So the first one is you have the heating oils just right above. You have the air inside, they are heating the air straight, and that heats the food. In the, in the indirect heating, there's no heating oil. You have hot air coming in into your plumbing chamber where you are cooking the product. Okay, that's the difference. So indirect band oven, uh, it's again, you can see the top plumbing uh, chamber, and then the product moves in here. Okay. Some of these baking uh, uh, systems are huge. Uh, I'll tell you like at least the one I have seen, this is for Mickey Foods. I don't know how many of you know what the product in the marketplace is. It's like Little Debbie Cakes. I, mean, I don't know, maybe when you're young, you might have tried, but maybe now you are too cautious about weight gain and whatnot. You may not eat that, but those are delicious little Libby products. Or same thing with hostess. So the little Libby, the baking, 
uh, oven is almost like the width of the center aisle. And then the length of that is football field. So imagine a, a, a cake of that size. Football field is like 100 yards, right? And then I don't know how many yards this would be, like maybe one, two, three, four, maybe four yards, right? I would say four yards width and 100 yards long. And then they'll be pouring the batter on one end, the cake will be keep coming out. Imagine, that's, that's phenomenal, okay? So this is kind of a, this is a band oven. And then we also have batch ovens, semi-continuous and continuous ovens. So this is very simple, roaster oven at home. Dutch oven, that's another thing completely in the baking operation and also roasting operation, I mentioned the heat comes from the bottom. That's why you have the hot air rises and whatnot. But Dutch oven, which is completely different, and you put the food inside, and put the lid and then put the fire on top, right? Dutch ovens are very different. And then baking ovens, you can see this is all like batch type ovens. Uh, you may have seen in restaurants, food service institutions, like our own homes. But the continuous band oven, we already saw that, it's another image. And then this is tunnel oven. In the tunnel oven, the beauty here is each zone, they can set a different temperature. So as the product is moving, they may have an initial uh, uh, place where they'll increase the humidity. They'll actually even spray water droplets. And then you'll have hot air. So hot, humid air will do the cooking. Then the next stage, you'll have a dry air, but at a different temperature. So they could get a different characteristics for the food. So this is a, a tunnel oven in that case where various locations, various zones can have different temperature. Jet impingement oven. This is a newer technology that's developed, I would say around 2000 before that it was not there. So instead of sending the air, just regular air, they will send the air at a very high velocity, like, like jet, okay? And then because of that, the heat transfer coefficients for the convection heat transfer will get increased many fold. So you get the cooking done very fast. And how many of you have seen a lot of uh, places uh, like Pizza Hut, if you want to go, you go through a drive through and then by the time you pay your uh, amount and then you drive to the counter, your pizza is ready. That's basically jet impingement oven. So they put the pizza on one side and then it comes out, done, very quick, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the technology here. So I, I also have a, a jet impingement oven. I may have seen this something like this in uh, many places, many food service places. Yeah. I used to have one in my, in my lab in Virginia, not here. So we used to make beef. You know, and I want to be bringing high school kids to introduce food science to them. We'll make pizza for in front of them. So they make all the toppings and then put it on one end. They make the pizza is there already. Wow, so quick, you know? And it's not, not very expensive. It's about like $10,000 you can get one. Yeah. Coffee roasting is another uh, unique process where in which case the roasting happens in a drum. And then the drum rotates. The drum outside of the drum, you either have heating coils or you have a, a, a jacketed drum where you have hot air inside. So it will heat the drum. So the drum is so hot. And then as the nut gets um, you know, mixed and rotated, you get an even roasting. Okay. And then once the roasting is done, then they push the roasting, roasted nuts on a, on a pan for that to cool and take it out. So the same similar roasting drums are used for uh, roasting peanut, roasting almonds, roasting pistachios. You can see that it's a very, very common piece of instrument for roasting. This, this also does, this is a batch roasting. What I, what I have seen is a continuous roasting, 
where in this case, you have a, a coil kind of thing. So that will move the product from one end of the drum to the other end. Okay. How are you in cooking? That's also roasting, but you, you do it under the buried pit. I don't know how many of you have been to Hawaii. It's it's intense heat. Right? They they put like it's almost like a Dutch oven kind of concept, but then they cook the whole whole animal, pretty much like the whole pig. Yeah. Luau, right? So let's look into broiling and grilling. It's a dry form of cooking. Use an intense heat. The temperature should be more than 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Normally it's about like 800 or even higher. But the, the, the critical thing is it's about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. In broiling. Uh, both grilling and broiling uh, are very similar. Same way like when you talked about baking and roasting, but the predominant heat transfer in broiling and grilling is ready, not convection. Convection is there, conduction is there, radiation is there, but the predominant heat transfer during broiling and grilling is radiant heat. Okay, radiation heat transfer. So the main difference is with regard to broiling and grilling is the distance from the heat source. In a grilling, most of the time the heat comes from the bottom. You are your grill. You put the food on the grill and then your, your fire is at the bottom. But the distance from the fire compared to your broiling in an oven, mostly some of the broiling coil could be both top and bottom, but the distance is different. So the distance makes a huge difference. The, the outdoor grill, you also really have actual fire, right? The temperature of the fire is what? Like our gas flame. It could be really thousands of degrees. So since it's, it's so hot, you got to keep the food a little farther. The distance from the fire is more in a grilling operation than in a broiling, right? Broiling, it can be really close to the broiling coil. The temperatures are not that high compared to your actual flame. Flame coming from your coal or flame coming from your gas burners. It's intense heat. And again, with regard to the heat, as you move away from the heat source, it's power law, right? Like, you know, if you go close to the heat, you will feel the heat very much. But as you move away from the heat source, it's going down in, in a, in a, in a uh, let me show you here. This is power law. So this is the source of the heat, you will feel very, very hot. But as you walk away from the heat source, you'll see like this. So after you walk for a while, you may not even feel the heat. That's what like, you know, when, when, when you really see, we have winter here with sun far away and then summer, it's so hot. But actually the distance between summer and winter from the earth to sun is not that much, the distance, but you can really feel that because of the power law. Okay, as you are getting closer or going away from the heat source. Okay. So heat transfer and mass transfer during either broiling or grilling, mostly as I said, radiation heat transfer, conduction inside the food. Again, there is also water loss. There is water diffusion happens. One beautiful thing with the grilling or even sometimes broiling, there is fat coming out of the product, fat loss. Okay, the fat, so let's say you have to put a drip pan in the bottom of your grill to catch the fat. So broiling in the oven have coils, burners. <clears throat> Mostly they are under the oven or sometimes you can do. Home stoves are built with safety measures. As soon as they reach 500 degrees, the oven will turn off. So this is one of the broiling tips that I found from a cooking book. So I don't know how scientific it is, 
but you can really see some some voice message. Keep the pan before putting the food on it. This will shorten the cook time. And then maintain the broiler temperature high. Keep the oven drawer open while broiling. This will keep the temperature never reach a high. And then maintain its temperature. So I don't know how far that is true. Okay, maybe nowadays we have modern, ultra modern um, you know, broilers that may not work out. So this is just again one of the tip from a cookbook. Tandu. I don't know how many of you heard this terminology. It's a, a way of cooking in, in clay ovens where the clay itself is so hot, um, temperatures about like 1000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And then the food is placed inside that. So most of the time they have marinated food. When you talk about meat products and whatnot, so they add more water, like they add more marinade. So you can have a juicy product to come out. So this is a tandoor oven. You can see that's a clay oven. Now they even put the breads on the side. This is a skewer kind of thing where the meat is there. So they are cooked in, 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 in intense heat. So tandoor, and you can see grills, quite a number of grills available in the marketplace, both gas burners to I think you can read, this is just general information about grills. We also have infrared burners that's coming up. Uh, infrared burners are most, either it's gas <clears throat> operated. I've seen some electric ones too, but they have intense heat. It can even go higher temperature. So more grills pictures. Rotisserie, that's also grilling. A lot of people said roasting, right? But rotisserie is grilling operation. See, it's again intense heat. Inside, you you have a hot oven, almost like a grill, and then you rotate this inside that. So this is very much like you are uh, grilling on the fire with in in a pit where you rotate your your meat. So rotisserie is same. So rotisserie ovens are also. Infrared burners along with grill burners. So the other important feature is how fast you are turning. And you know, some play sometimes like the spits are placed to the so close to the grill, they do not allow sufficient room for the food to turn. So you need to this is here, it's basically the turning is very critical. Then Brazilian grilling. It's very similar, like some similar to rotisserie, similar to tandoor, but again, intense heat and where they rotate their food and then they bring the whole rod of meat to your table and they'll basically slice it up for you. I don't know how many of you tried Brazilian restaurants. There are a couple in, in, in the Twin Cities. Have been, any of you have tried? It's, it's fancy, like you now they keep feeding you. They will bring meat right up this grill, then they will serve you. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's already experience. I'm a vegetarian, so normally I get cheese and I get vegetables, fruits that were um, cooked in the same grill, but meat eaters, it's meat eaters galore. Yeah. Yeah, this is a Brazilian grilling. So I think I'll stop here. Any any questions? Yeah, I have a question. So where does yeah. like smoking like fall along? Is it like is it like roasting or is it is it its own category? Itself? It's on its own category. Okay. Yes, because smoking is mostly moist heat. It's not it's not dry heat, but uh, and this. Kind of like smoking also, it has its own unique, what is it like, you know, microbial killing property. Smoke has the antimicrobial property. So the smoke also adds flavor, adds so many other things. So by itself, it's its own operation. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, any other questions? From the Zoom group?
No? So I'll finish five minutes before the class time. So if you have any, anything else you want to do? Any questions that are on to your exam or anything? No? Okay. So we'll see Friday, talk about throwing, another fascinating field. Yeah.